Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? My nose is a little stuffy this morning, so please excuse me if I have to sniff a lot. <coughs> yeah, a bunch of rain last night, and so it blew a bunch of stuff in. I'm hoping it's going to calm it down here in a little while. This morning, we're going to be reading out of Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. The whole verse says, uh, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Now, we need to read this in context. You can't take this verse out of context. So let's go up here. All right, we'll start here in verse, you know, yeah, we'll start here in verse five. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. We have that happening today. People are, are very mindful of what we do or and where we go and, and who we're interacting with. People are they'll they'll look for any excuse to shout down somebody, condemn somebody. I remember a, a pastor was telling a story and he was a uh, he was he, he was a an under pastor or not really a co pastor but you know in the pastor team of a church and a young man had come in recently got saved and he welcomed they welcomed him in and uh, you know it was told to this pastor by the lead pastor that he this kid that they'd been talking to him for quite some time he was um, he was a pretty hard case but he but the Lord won him over so that under pastor was at an intersection and saw this guy walking down the street and saw him go down a particular street that he knew, and this is a true story, that he knew was a place where a lot of the prostitutes hung out. And so when, you know, he went back and he got home, he called the lead pastor and said, I, I just saw him go down there uh, where the prostitutes are. And as I was driving by, I saw him talking to them. We can't have him in the church. He's down there with the prostitutes. You know, how, how, who are we to, how, how, how can we do that? And when he got done with his whole spiel, the uh, lead pastor said, did you not do any research on him? Did you not hear anything that was told about him? He's going down there and he's preaching to them. He goes down there every day and shares gospel with them. And he's led many of those women out of that by preaching the gospel. We are too quickly looking at what's going on in the flesh and judging by that activity. <laughs> judging by what we see that assaults our senses. And we, we like to try to hold ourselves away from that and say, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't get involved in any of that stuff. Really? I, 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 don't, I don't partake in those things. Really? And, and I'll use Al Alistair's situation as an, another example. I commented to somebody the other day because they were talking about, you know, a Christian shouldn't even be anywhere near stuff like that. And I was like, well, that's funny because I'm, I guarantee at some point in your life, you stayed in a hotel where down in the banquet room they were having a wedding and it most likely was a gay wedding. So you were in the same building. That's happened to a lot of people and they never even realized it. I commented to someone today who was doing the same thing, judging by according to the flesh. How he shouldn't have done this because he's he just throws the Bible away, being an accuser of the brethren like Satan, like a lot of people. I said, so when uh, God says, assemble before me, this is what I commented this morning. So when God says, assemble before me, all who have made compromises and concessions in life to give an account, you'll be there too, right? Because we'll all be there. Because every one of us at some point in our life has made a compromise or a concession. Again, it comes, it doesn't come down to so much the action because those who live in the flesh is that's what they're looking at. The Lord is looking at the motivation. He's looking at what's in the heart. What's driving you to do what you're doing? And from one person to another standing right next to each other, the motivation for any one act can be vastly different. That's what the Lord is looking at, the motivation. 
<coughs> the driving force behind why you're doing what you, you are doing. And a whole group of people can look at that and go, oh, wow, what a terrible thing for a Christian to do, not realizing why it's being done. Because the why makes the difference. Two people, 200 people, 2 million people can do the exact same thing. The exact same physical act. Pick a random act and say 200 people are going to do this, all going to do this act. They all know why they're, they're going to do it. And then if you go and you compare the motivation between the people, you'll see something shocking. Because some may do that act that others may deem evil or bad or wrong. Some will do it for another out of the strongest sense of love you can imagine. And a lot of people are like, no, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be doing that. I don't care if it's for love or not. Really? Who's the judge of love? Us? Because the Bible says God is the God of love. He created it. And so if we're going to judge according to the flesh, we better make sure that we are the most pious. We are walking in the most fo biggest form of righteousness. Because then we just, we just get exposed ourselves as hypocrites if we're judging according to the flesh. And that's what he's talking about here in Romans 8, 5. We haven't even gotten to our target verse yet. So those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. What are the things of the spirit? Love, peace, joy, faith, truth, worship, praise, glory. All the things that attain to God. But a great many people today are not like that. They are, like verse 6 says, carnally minded. For to be carnally minded is death. There are carnal Christians. And the only Christians that get mad when I say that are carnal Christians. Because if you're not a carnal Christian, it shouldn't upset you because that doesn't, it ain't talking about you. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. I find that interesting. We are all subject to the law of God in one way or another. Even though the law was, was removed out of, out of our way, it still, it still applies. Not that we follow it physically. <laughs> so that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Take a look at the, the cross section of a, of just YouTube, not, not even taking the other social media platforms into account, just YouTube and look at how people respond to things. I told another guy today, I said, I said you're accuser of a, you're an accuser of the brethren, just like Satan. Great, great work. Great work that you put yourself right there into Satan's shoes and do exactly what he does. The accuser of the brethren. We have no business accusing other people. We call out false doctrine when we see it. We will correct, reprove, rebuke, teach. But they're going taking it to the extreme. Going into an area that isn't, the type of judgment that isn't for us. That's for God only. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. You must have the spirit of Christ. What would that spirit look like? A spirit of love, spirit of compassion, spirit of truth. Um, it, it would it would it come across almost as like a supernatural understanding or a supernatural draw to those things. And if Christ is in you, verse 10, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The flesh, no account. It is the spirit that is important. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so those things that we naturally do, according to the flesh, we have to put a stop to, we have to put to death. <coughs> we have to put away from us. And so we start to do that. Now that, that just doesn't encompass specific things people think make them pious. There's Christians out there that think because they stop drinking alcohol, that makes them righteous. No, it doesn't. You just stop drinking alcohol. Or they stop eating certain things, or they stop doing certain things, they stop going certain places, and they think that makes them pious and righteous and holy. No, it does nothing for you, except you just got away from those things. What that does is it takes those things out of your life and makes room for godly things. Doing the godly things, does that make you more safe? No. Your salvation stands all by itself. These things are things that are a natural progression of your sanctification. As you grow in grace, grow in the spirit, grow in faith. You start to do less of the fleshly things and more of the spiritual things. But there are a lot of people today, I see them, who are living according to the flesh. Because when a situation happens, like the situation with Alistair, or any of them that have been, happened over the last five years, they respond according to the flesh, not according to the spirit. Like I said, like I said a few days ago, I'm glad this happened because it has exposed people for who they really are. It has exposed what's really in their heart. And I love that we're covering Romans 8 here because it talks about that. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, if you're led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, these are sons of God. We are sons, and that word encompasses everybody. That is like the sons, daughters, children. For if you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And then there's a future glory. And this is for Alistair. I know he's not going to read this. And, <clears throat> and he is far above and beyond my senior in this. But this is for his encouragement. And all others who suffer like this, because there he's just one. There are hundreds, even thousands of people who are suffering very similar scenarios. Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so that's encouragement for him and for everybody. Don't let these people bring you down because it is nonsense what's happening. It is a fleshly response to a spiritual situation. But what do they see? All they see all they see. Oh, how dare you go to that? I could have never done that. And yet there are people sitting out there reading all this stuff and watching all this stuff. They're like, well, I've had to make that decision before. You guys know I admitted I had to do it. I've had to make that decision before. And it was something that I had to sit down with the Lord in prayer and make a judgment call on. It. What was the motivation behind doing it? And of course, they all take it out of context. He's saying all Christians can go to all gay weddings and trans weddings. No, he didn't. Not even close. So those people who are pretending like they were speaking righteously when they were uh, rebuking him for it in their videos actually were lying about what he said because that's not what he said. Satan got his way in a lot of people's hearts here. I'm not letting that happen. I don't want that to happen. So silly how badly people and how quickly people turn on each other. And that's not what we're called to do at all, not even close. So I love that we're covering this today because um, this is good. But let's get to the target verse. As God's creatures, we are all debtors to him, to obey him with all our body, our soul, and strength. Having broken his commandments, as we all have, having broken his commandments, as we all have, we are debtors to his justice, and we owe to him a vast amount, which we are not able to pay. So for those that were listening that may have been like, oh, look, see, this devotion is going to prove him wrong. Nope. 
This is not what this is talking about. But of the Christian, it can be said that he does not owe God's justice anything, for Christ has paid the debt his people owed. For this reason, the believer owes the more to love. Let that marinate for a second. <coughs> But of the Christian, it can be said that he does not owe God's justice anything. For Christ has paid the debt his people owed. For this reason, the believer owes the more to love. I am a debtor to God's grace and forgiving mercy, but I am no debtor to his justice. For he will never accuse me of a debt already paid. Some of y'all are sitting here listening to this going, hmm, you know, I might have been on the fence about some things. I think I now understand which side I need to be on. Christ said it is finished. To Tetelestai. Actually, there's another word that is used in there. It's not Tetelestai, but it's close. And by that, he meant that whatever his people owed was wiped away forever from the book of remembrance. Christ to the uttermost has satisfied divine justice. The account is settled. The handwriting is nailed to the cross. The receipt is given. That receipt is the Holy Spirit, by the way, because that's, that's your marker. And we are debtors to God's justice no longer. But then, because we are not debtors to our Lord in that sense, we become ten times more debtors to God than we should have been otherwise. Christian, pause and ponder for a moment. What a debtor thou art to divine sovereignty. How much thou owest to his disinterested love. For he gave his own son that he might die for thee. Consider how much you owe to his forgiving grace after that after 10,000 affronts, he loves you as infinitely as ever, or in this case, after 10,000 mistakes, 10,000 concessions, 10,000 10,000 times that you stepped out of what everybody thought was right. And he still loves you as infinite, infinitely as ever. How are we going to judge each other by the mistakes we make and condemn each other and crucify each other by the mistakes we make when God doesn't hold those against us? It's legalism. Consider what you owe to his power, how he has raised you from your death in sin, how he has preserved your spiritual life, how he has kept you from falling, and how, though a thousand enemies have beset your path, you have been able to hold on your way. Consider what you owe to his immutability. Though you have changed a thousand times, he has not changed once. Thou art as deep in debt as thou canst, as thou canst be, to every attribute of God. To God thou owest thyself, and all thou hast yield thyself as a living sacrifice. It is but thy reasonable service. So this devotion is actually an answer to a prayer of mine concerning some of this stuff that's going on and some of the other situations I've seen develop because of it. This has been a, uh, this is an answer to a prayer of mine. What do we owe God? The initial answer is nothing. Jesus paid it all. But now that Jesus has done that and we have that free gift of salvation, now what do we owe him? We owe him to obey him and obey his word and do what it says. Not one part here or one part there. But when you see a situation that you have to deal with, you have to take the full weight of the entire word into account. You have to take the entire, the entire script and what it says into account. So in one area, it says this, but in another area, it says something else. Excuse me for just a second here. Sorry about that. <laughs> My earwood is falling out. We have to make a judgment call in everything we do in life. And there are some things that we're like, mm, I don't know if I should go here and do this. I don't know if I should talk to that person there. I don't know if I should partake or engage in this or in that. 
Should I be here to hear this conversation? Should I be? How many times are we caught unawares and realize we're someplace we shouldn't be that the Lord probably wouldn't be happy that we'll be? Does he condemn us because of it? No, of course not. How many times do we find ourselves? I'll go back in the past. My last church. Somebody, one of the one of the church members, uh, evidently could see where I was driving, and I was pulling off of this side street. And then later, the pastor comes up and says, "Hey, you were seen, you were seen uh, coming from this particular area. What were you doing over there?" And I was like, "What? Yeah, you were seen in this area. When?" Well, it doesn't really matter. Well, yeah, actually it does. Because sometimes I have to take different roads in order to get where I'm going. And uh, what's going on in that particular area is there's there's a lot of roads that are either really too rough to go over or they're closing them because they're patching them. And so I have to take a different route to get around depending on what where I'm coming from. Turned out I was coming back from Home Depot. There was a bunch of traffic going down the service road. So I went through some back roads. And it brought me out in a neighborhood that's not really a neighborhood you probably want to be in. And somebody saw me coming out of it and thought that I was hanging out in there and doing stuff with people. And I looked at it and it, it kind of, you know, came up and, and I was like, when did we become a Catholic church where we have to follow our people around and see what they're doing every minute of every day? He goes, well, as a pastor, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm responsible for my, the members of my church. And I'm like, so you've got police in your church following us around? Well, no, no, that's not what I'm doing. But that sure is what it sounds like. I said, technically, your job is pastor here in the church. What I do outside of your church is nobody's business. And where I go and who I interact with and what road I take coming back from the, from the Home Depot because other roads are closed is nobody's business but mine. So they, what, they, what they were trying to do, and a lot of churches do this, is they were trying to catch catch me in something to see if I was doing something that they didn't agree with. And what was funny was is that they even took that to the extreme and started spreading it around the church. And I'm, I made it very clear. This is none of, none of y'all's business. You are all adults. You know better. It's none of your business what I do and where I do it. None of your business. If you got a problem with the kind of person I am or where I'm going or what I'm doing, then you tell me to leave and I'll leave and I won't come back. But see, that would have been really bad for them at that time because I was doing a whole bunch of stuff in that church that they would have all had to do if I wasn't there. And I thought really hard about leaving. And I didn't. I stayed there a few years. And then I finally was like, I'm tired of this. Judgmental. Fleshly judgment. Judging on things they had no understanding of. And what was funny was the same people that were judging me were the ones that were doing worse. We were, we were asked a question one time. So, um, and the pastor was trying to catch people. So what would you, what, what would be considered something that would fall into the category of sin? This is an iron sharpens iron meeting. And, uh, somebody mentioned speeding and he goes, okay. He goes, that's, that's a good one. That's a real good one. So how many of us here speed? And the other guys put their hand up. Why didn't you put your hand up? I, said, I don't speed. No, everybody speeds. That's the, you're lying. I was like, I'm not lying. Because when I'm trying to keep up with everybody else, it causes me, because PTSD, the way we did a lot, it's a long story to get back into Iraq and how we did things. But it actually, um, I, I told him I set my cruise control and do the speed limit to keep me under control. It's my check and balance to keep me from getting mad at the people in the way they drive. So I do the speed limit or under. I said, and you can verify this with anybody. They actually don't like it when I do it. So my, my wife doesn't do that, but I do. Nobody else in that church admitted to not speeding. They all said, yeah, I'm actually, I'm a speeder. And they're going to sit and judge other people, and they're doing that. And that was funny because the pastor was, that's what he was trying to do. Well, you're going to judge somebody else for this, but then you're doing this. And it funny because it backfired on him and actually convicted him. And it was good. But they, they took that as me trying to be holier than thou. I'm like, I'm not. That's how I keep myself under control. And I said, let me tell you a story. When we had our, our Volkswagen Jetta, and this was before the program issue, if you ever heard about that with, with Volkswagen, that's why they quit having their diesel over here. 
But th there's a problem. Dodge is going through it right now with Cummins. There's a problem with diesel engines running on def fluid. They don't run right. And so you have to change the programming to make them run better in the computer. And they did that on those Volkswagens. And let me tell you something. That 2.0 turbocharged vet, uh, diesel Jetta was a rocket. That thing was so fast. I chased a guy down in a Charger at 140 mile an hour, and he could not get away from me. I, I left him in the dust. But it was road rage because he tr actually tried to push me off the road. A actively tried to push me. And uh, I ran him down. And I was trying to get him to pull over. So that scared me. So after that day, I decided I'm not going to, I'm not going to go over the speed limit anymore. I'm not going to put myself in those situations anymore. I'm going to take myself out of that because that keeps me from sinning. It keeps me from making a mistake. It keeps me from putting other people in danger. My father was in the car. If we'd have wrecked, that'd have been it. So I put checks and balances in place to watch over myself. And they all just sat there quietly. And then they changed the subject. I'm not sitting here trying to be special. I'm not trying to hold myself up to be some kind of saint. I sin too. I struggle in the flesh too. But I'm certainly, since I do the same things everybody else does, I'm certainly not going to judge another person because of it. I'll share scripture with them, but if I'm doing it too, how dare I tell somebody else, hey, you got a speck in your eye and I've got a whole beam sticking out of mine. So we're not debtors to the flesh. And this is this is the whole draw here. This is the whole point, bringing it all down. We're not debtors to the flesh. You want to sit here and you want to judge people according to the flesh? Great work. That's what Satan does. We're going to judge people according to the spirit because that's right judgment. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're told to do. And that's what we're supposed to do. Right judgment is vastly different than regular judgment. Now, there are some things in the flesh we go to people about. Hey, that's really not something you should be partaking in. Hey, this is, going to, this is dangerous. Hey, this is only going to lead one place. We don't condemn them for it. We go to them in the spirit. And what does the spirit do? Love, compassion, understanding. It, it tries to draw them out of those things. That's not what we see happening today. We see people being debtors to the flesh. We're not debtors to the flesh, guys. We're born again. We're citizens of, citizens of heaven. We no longer have a debt or owe a debt to the flesh. We owe a debt to God. And that debt is to do his word. To follow along with what his word says in every situation that we possibly can. And will we do it perfectly? No. But how amazing that his forgiveness and his mercy endure forever. And even if we continue to make mistakes and every single Christian does, he still has that forgiveness and mercy over us. Our justification carries us through. Our sanctification carries us out. And ultimately our redemption will free us fully from what we have to endure every day. Constant fight between the flesh and the spirit. Constant fight between the inner man and the outer man. So let's not judge others based on things we see in the flesh. Or better yet, let's not condemn others based on what we see in the flesh. But instead, let's look and see what the spirit would say on those situations. Because it just may be that that brother or sister we see sinning, may need somebody with a compassionate heart to help them understand. But if you run to them with anger, if you judge them, you shut the door. And they just pointed, look, these Christians are just like us. There's nothing, no difference between them. And then people get a very, very bad impression of what Christianity really is. That's, that's evident today. And that's why I say there's only a small group, a remnant of the church that's really hanging on to the right things. And we're covering it in the letters. The letters to the churches. You can see the, the worldwide picture of the worldwide church and how it fits into all those stereotypes. We can be different. As individuals, we can be different. We can hold ourselves to a different standard. We can hold ourselves accountable. And we do that. Not like we're riding a high horse. Not like we're trying to be special but that we just do it his way. We see things vastly differently and we respond to them vastly differently because we've had a change of mind. 
about all these things. So instead of being a debtor to the flesh, let's be a debtor to God. I would rather be a debtor to God because he forgives debts than a debtor to the flesh that holds on to debts. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory and to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. Your timing in this answering one of my prayers is great. Romans 8, 12 is a perfect, perfect lead into that, a perfect helper in explaining the situation because a lot of people are on the fence about certain things that have happened recently uh, and others that are going to happen in the very, very near future. And, uh, you know, Satan is accusing the brethren. And so he's, he's causing us to point fingers at each other. He's bringing the, the flesh part, the carnal part of believers up and making it to show itself. Lord, suppress that. May we not be carnal Christians. May we not be, be fleshly in our responses to things, but instead walk in the spirit, walk in truth, walk in love, walk in compassion, do things your way, the way you told us to do them according to your word so that we are not debtors to the flesh, but debtors to you. And you forgive debts. <laughs> So why wouldn't we be debtors to you? Lord, make us to do things your way, to not be an accuser, to not attack others, to not bring other people down, to not look at their physical acts and, and judge them harshly because of it, because we do the same things and we don't even realize it. We partake in the same evils and don't even know. And we're going to sit here and we're going to chastise or condemn or crucify someone else over something done in the flesh when we do the same thing. And there's people, I know there's already people out there that are they're like, I don't go to trans and gay weddings. No, but you make concessions and compromises. And that, that goes right along the same criteria there. And Lord, again, we get back to your word where you don't look at what the motivation is, um, Externally, you look at what the motivation is internally. What's the motivation of the heart when we do things? Are we putting ourselves in harm's way or in a dangerous position because we want to partake in sin? Or are we doing it because of a love for another and we're putting our life on the line for them? A lot of people f forget, you know, greater love has no man than this, that he give his life for his friends. That doesn't necessarily mean you dying. That could be you putting yourself in harm's way for another. <laughs> That could be me reaching my arm out into the darkness to grab somebody and pull them out. And we forget that. We forget that that this gospel is to be shared everywhere. And this love in our heart that you have shed abroad in our heart is to be shared with everyone. How are we supposed to invite people in if they think we hate them? And it's so terrible, the, the, the double standard that we've reached today. Lord, forgive us for this. Forgive us for these mistakes. Forgive us for, for sinning against you in this way. Forgive us for being carnal and make us to be spiritual. Make us to think, see, act, and do things in, from a spiritual standpoint so that our motivations are pure and our motivations are true. We do all this for your glory. We do all this to your praise. We do all this because we are your children and this is what we are supposed to do as your children. Walk in this way and things will be well. I'm not following the crowd, Lord. I don't want to follow the crowd. I did that all my life trying to fit in and it was nothing but a disaster. I don't want to follow the crowd. I want to follow you. And what that looks like is me walking down a different path, going a different direction than everybody else is going. And I mentioned in a previous video, you know, when you see a lot of people go after something, there's a pretty good chance if the majority is going after it, there's probably something wrong with it. And in these cases here lately, that's exactly what the, the case is. But we see the few following after you, the few following after the Spirit. Lord, may that always be the way, but I pray that more people see this and change their mind and go the right direction. Do things the right way and, and walk in love. You gave us the, the two most important commandments, which encompass the 10, faith and love. In 1 John, it says faith and love. 
Because John asks the same question you asked, Lord, or makes the same statement you made. If you love me, keep my commandments. John does that, and he tells us what the commandments are, faith and love. And this is the whole law. And what we see on the world stage today is that not happening. It is happening, but it's happening in a very small degree and in a very small select group of people. Lord, may we ever glorify you in our actions and in our deeds. May we ever be found watching for you and found doing what you've given us to do so that we may glorify you in this life, in the actions we perform in this life, when we walk and live in the Spirit. May we have our minds changed and may we always glorify you, worship you, honor you, bring to your praise, give thanks for all the wonderful blessings you've given us. May we show that we are truly believers by being changed by you and by the Spirit within us for your glory. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. You know, I, I hate to keep bringing it up, but I think there's a very valid point being made here because these are all applicable. If, again, Paul, I'll do all these great works. If there's no love in it, it's worthless. What's the motivation behind what you're doing? If it's love, true, genuine love, that changes everything in the eyes of God. When he looks at the motivation of why we did our actions, I've used this analogy before. Two men sitting in church or two women, they're going to give to the church because there's a special fundraiser going on for a specific charity. One person gives a thousand, another person gives a thousand. Two same people sitting in the church. Each one gives a thousand. Whose gift is better? And Jesus gave a, a story on this. Well, whoever had the motivation of they were giving because of love, love for God, love for whoever that was going to go help, and they gave because they wanted to give out of the goodness of their heart, that's the greater gift. The thousand dollars is irrelevant. It's why the thousand dollars was given that is relevant. And Jesus talked about this with the woman that threw the two mites, two little tiny coins, all she had left, threw two mites in the treasury for the house of God. She gave her gift out of love for God. So her gift was more righteous. Her gift was greater than ones who were throwing whole bags of money in there. They gave of all their excess. They had so much that it was nothing for them to throw a bag of money in there. She gave out of nothing. But she did it because of love. They did it because of duty. Big difference in your gift. But you see that her gift was better even though the, the money was irrelevant. It was the motivation. It was the motivation. And we see over and over again, God looks at the motivation behind who we are and what we do and why we do it. Because that is what makes it special. That is what makes it right. That is what makes it holy and that is what makes it righteous. Why we're doing it. Not what we're doing, but why we're doing it. And when he looks at that and we look at the flesh, because we can't see the heart, when we look at the flesh and we judge a person by the flesh, but God has looked at that same scenario and says, I know why that happened and I have deemed that righteous. Lot was considered a righteous man, yet he lived in the homosexual capital of the world at that time next to Rome and had an incestuous relationship which bore children from his two daughters. And he was considered righteous. Why would that be? It took me a long time to figure this out. Why would that be? Motivation. Intent. What was his intent? And the Bible tells us what the intent was. That's why they weren't condemned for that. And we can go through all the scriptures and you can see all these actions that are done. And you, if you pay attention, it, the, the scriptures actually tell you the motivation behind why they did it. If a person gives a million dollars to somebody 
And I forget where the verse is. I found it here a while back. But if a person gives a million dollars to somebody, but they hate the per hate the person or the cause, they're just doing it to look good. And another person doesn't have any money to give, but wishes they could. Which gift is which gift is greater? And I forget where the verse is, but it talks about that your intentions, your motivations, are also taken into account, even if you can't do the action. The person who wanted to give but couldn't had a greater gift than the person who gave. The gift, the action, is nowhere near as relevant as why. So we're debtors. Not to the flesh, not to the action. We're debtors to the motivation, to God, to the reason why. A lot of people don't realize all the things that happened. Oh, God went in there. He had all these, this whole civilization wiped out. Men, women, children, and the animals. Right. But did you read why he did it? So you're looking at the action and judging by the flesh. But did you look at what it says why he did it? Because if you see why he did it, then you realize, oh, well, that needed to happen. Yeah, exactly. That's why he did it. It had to happen. If he hadn't have flooded the earth and killed all but eight people, the giants and the Nephilim and all the other things that were running around the earth would have eaten every human being. And the human race would have died out. God had to destroy all that. Now, that's just, not, that's just one motivation. There were other motivations in there, too. My whole point is that we've got to stop being, being so judgmental in the wrong way and start using a right judgment on this. And that requires us to go into the Bible and find out what that right judgment is. And go to the Lord in prayer and ask him, Lord, show me the truth on this. And he will. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I'll see you in the next video.